Shalom from Jerusalem and welcome to the second part of our conversation on Watchmen Talk with retired Admiral and Professor Shaul Chorev. Hello. It is my pleasure. In the, our first conversation, um, as we um, were closing it, we talked about um, the landing craft branch of uh, navies in general and Israel in particular. And you referred to a landing operation in 1982 when um, the Navy uh, offloaded um, a paratroop unit on the coast of Lebanon, uh, where from they went on towards Beirut. Now, Israel does not have Marines, doesn't have a Marine Corps, but sometimes it trains particular units of infantry to take part in such operations. Nevertheless, we haven't seen one uh, before or after 1982. Uh, does uh, this sort of operation have a future uh, with the Israeli Defense Forces and in particular in the Navy? I think that uh, when you are speaking about the war, you have to distinguish what is the nature of the war and what is the characteristic of the war, warfare. And one of the things that uh, with regard to landing and when we are speaking about the success, uh, successful landing in, in Chun in Korea in 1950, is that uh, the, the, the shore is not in the same uh, character that uh, it was in the 80s or 60s or, or in the 50s. Because currently we can see that there is the littoral warfare and you can have on the shore uh, uh, weapons that you can use it against these boats, landing craft, and everything. This is the example which you cited earlier of the Hanit missile boat being hit right. by Hezbollah from the coast. Right, right. So speaking about the uh, uh, landing uh, operation, I think that uh, there is a place for what we call amphibious operations. And I think that navies recognize it, that uh, they need such capabilities, but uh, they design it to do it uh, away from the shore. So they have an uh, amphibious boat, a very big one with helicopters and uh, LCTs and all such things, but they uh, uh, deliver them in far from the, from the shore. So when they reach the shore, they are not vulnerable as it is with the landing boat that has, has to put the, the, what we call the door on the shore. So when you are uh, uh, speaking about such things, I think it's not only for landing, but also for other areas and other doctrines that you have in naval warfare. warfare. And uh, you can see that today there is a, a, a change, a, a total change in the character of the naval warfare, uh, the decisive battle that we were in the midway. Currently, you don't have a decisive battle. You can see the, the U.S. Navy, uh, let's say, uh, trying to prepare themselves in the South China Sea. And what is the most big uh, science that they have? They have a big flag of the U.S. flag, and they are uh, busy with freedom of navigation. So no decisive battle as it was in the Midway. And I think one of the things that uh, we have to distinguish earlier is what is the mission? For instance, the Israeli Navy doing all the protection of the gas infrastructure, it's constabulary. It's not an army mission. It's a Coast Guard mission. So that's in a broad sense refer to your question, what I'm speaking about, uh, the possibility of landing with such a boat. Nevertheless, when one speaks with the commanding generals of uh, the Northern Command, which is, of course, an army uh, position, or the subordinate division commanders, uh, brigadier generals, they always refer to their colleagues from the Navy as our Western division. Because if there is another war in Lebanon or with Lebanon or with Syria, they expect the Navy to come out from its main base uh, in Haifa or another base in Ashdod and help the ground forces as well as the Air Force um, complete their plan. You're right. Once you have a boat and the boat have a standoff uh, weapons 
and uh, accurate missile on such a things that can hit targets on the land. I think that it is one of the mission, and I think that the current Israeli Navy commander, chief in command, identified that he has to support such an operation from the sea, but not to approach. And you have all the weapons standoff that you can operate it from, uh, from uh, off the shores, ranges that you are not harmed, and you're right. There is a, such a mission that the Israeli Levy should fulfill in the war. Now, going back to your own career in the uh, 1970s and through the 80s and 90s, yours is a very unique case of uh, a relatively senior officer moving from surface, from missile boats um, to submarines. How did that come about? The submarine flotilla had some problems, uh, and uh, the, the commanding officer of the flotilla, he was also a commanding officer of uh, a, a submarine, uh, grounded on the Carmel Reefs. So they have to change the, 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 the guy. And uh, I finished my uh, job as a squadron commander in the Red Sea, in Sharm el Sheikh. A squadron commander of what? Missile boats which we were patrolling the Red Sea and the Strait of Babel and all such things. And uh, I was uh, told that I will have to go to the headquarters. And I decided to write a letter to the chief of the Israeli Navy, uh, Admiral Barkai, and uh, to tell him that uh, I think that I haven't yet fulfilled my mission as a squadron commander of a missile boat in the Red Sea, and there is sufficient time that I will serve in the headquarters. And he called me and he mentioned that uh, there he would like to speak about another things. There is a problem in the submarine flotilla. Uh, and uh, asked me to decide within two minutes if uh, I agree to go there and to start from the low level. And uh, what he mentioned that uh, when you have an uh, artificial, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bodies that you try to get in, a body, then the body can uh, reject, reject reject the implant. Yes, and uh, I went there. It was uh, two minutes. That's a very long uh, period uh, to decide. Uh, when when did you reach your decision? The first minute or the second one? Uh, at the same meeting, at the same meeting, and then all my career changed. What he offered that uh, I would not be harmed by the promotion that I'm going to the submarine flotilla, and uh, I think that they. They did it when I finished the commanding of the submarine flotilla. I got the captain uh, rank. But, uh, so you, you went to submariner <coughs> class just like a raw recruit coming in at 18 yes. years? Yes. And yes. how old were you at the time? 32 or 30, something like this, yes. And uh, I was treated as a young uh, sailor. I was uh, checked by a uh, lieutenant uh, I have to study the, the system of the submarine, and they didn't hesitate when I didn't perform well to tell me, go back and uh, improve your performance. Even though they knew that you were supposed to be their commanding officer later. Yes, but I appreciate it very much because I think that uh, when you are speaking about people going from the, let's say, paratrooper to the armed uh, brigades, they are doing some kind of uh, uh, conversion. conversion which is not real. And I think that uh, to be in the submarine flotilla, you have to do it from the lower level. And uh, then I went abroad to take a submarine of a commanding officer course. And uh, where? Uh, in another country, uh, which Israel had a good relation at that time. What type of personality does one need in order to be a submariner? First of all, I think that uh, you need to have uh, some psychological uh, characteristic that uh, you can live with as a person and uh, you don't have your privacy. You have to know that uh, everybody is, uh, and as a commanding officer, you don't have the privilege to separate for yourself in the cabin or something like this because all the time you're exposed, uh, your room is adjacent to the cooks, uh, to the to the uh, cooking. And, um, Everybody is looking at you. So the only things that uh, you can do there is to prove your performance 
from the lower level up to the commanding officer. It seems as if it's very difficult to be a submariner and even more difficult to be an Israeli submariner. Yes, you're right. And uh, that's the benefit of being a submariner because uh, people are, uh, let's say, uh, measuring you according to your performance. It's not, uh, you can, can't demonstrate. Uh, then if you are speaking about a crew member, they are very dependent on the commanding officer because they have no idea what is happening outside. Who is the, uh, the commanding officer is the only one who is looking through the periscope and doing all the decision, and uh, they are very dependent on him, safety of uh, diving, as well as the operational. Uh, they don't even know the mission uh, of the... Uh, usually, usually in a broad sense, yes. Sometimes not, uh, not uh, entirely, because there are some intelligence missions that they are not uh, exposed to it, and that's good. Is it uh, also one of the missions to take naval commanders somewhere? Yes, I think uh, also that uh, there is a capability, such a capability, and uh, sub, it's not the Israeli, uh, we were not the first one. You can see it with the Italian Navy, submarines with commando that uh, did all these uh, nice things in the Alexandria, even the Shira, which is in the in Haifa. Haifa base, uh, was scheduled to, to be joined by commandos. Uh, And the uh, Italians uh, were uh, actually the uh, chaperons of uh, the Israeli yeah. naval commandos. And, and I think that uh, part of their equipment were transferred to the Israeli Navy, Yochai and his, their guys, and uh, they were proved to be excellent. So, so Admiral Horev, um, could you answer a simple qualitative as well as quantitative question, which uh, apparently uh, has divided... Many experts in Israel. How many submarines does Israel need? I'll, I'll answer it. And I think that uh, first of all, you have to, uh, and that's not the, the, the armed forces and, and not the idea staff uh, decision. You have to decide what is the, your objectives. Uh, and if you want to have, for instance, all the time, one submarine at sea, dedicated for a special mission, uh, you should need at least five submarines. Special mission meaning deterrence and or war fighting? Usually you, 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 you differentiate it be- between these. And you're right, uh, we are, uh, all the navies, they have, uh, for deterrence, they have uh, a special submarines. And here we're using the same fleet. For instance, the... The, sub, the, the French, they have their submarines in Brest for such a, in Cherbourg in such a mission, and in Toulon in such a mission. So, so the Americans have attack submarines and SSBNs. Yes, you're right. So when you are speaking about the submarines with a mixed mission, only the, the, the let's say, the, the political level should define what is their objectives. And if they would say that they would like that there will be more than one submarine, I think that it will take you to six. When you are speaking about uh, from the contractual and uh, uh, let's say uh, organization and point of view, I think that six is better than five because you are speaking about the quantity of uh, three. Three, three, three. So when... You, you mean because of, of arenas of theaters or because Um, a submarine, like any other boat, uh, must be uh, maintained, uh, must right. be docked uh, for... Right. And, and uh, speaking about two submarines, because if you are speaking about five, it's three plus two, and what will be the next generation. And when we are speaking today about the next generation submarine, we should bear in our mind that uh, the submarine that we design... Uh, and uh, put the requirement in, uh, in the technologies of the early 80s. So I'll not give you the, 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 the exact uh, answer, but my opinion is that the Israeli Navy need uh, six submarines to fulfill all the missions. The missions so, uh, so half of them? It's not the... in half of them, because it's, uh, it depends. But it will give you the opportunity first to train people, than to do all the missions which are, let's say, conventional missions. And the Israeli Navy submarines are working 
very, very hard. I think that it was uh, published also in the media. And then, in central times, you need them for, for, for what we speak about, deterrence. So but, my, my opinion, and I think that I'm not the only one who is speaking about it, I think that uh, uh, Admiral Ayalon thinking about it, I think that Yossel uh, Edro in the early 60s. The pioneer of the submarine. The pioneer of the submarine. When he was asked about the number, he, speak, he spoke also about six submarines. But if we know that right now Israel's uh, biggest threat is Iran. And uh, Iran, of course, is not in the Mediterranean theater. But can you deter Iran from the Mediterranean? Or do you have to be closer to the Hormuz Straits, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean? Today, when you are speaking about uh, the loss of the, let's say, when we are speaking about strategic depths, you have the, only in the, the Mediterranean Sea, you have such a, a possibility to do it from there. And then you should uh, decide whether you have the capability of the, of, the, the, of the weapons from the Mediterranean or not. By measuring the distance, the distance from the Strait of Hormuz to Tehran are the same as from the Eastern Mediterranean to Tehran. So that's, I think, answer your question. Um, what does the uh, opening of the Suez Canal uh, do for Israel or against it? You probably uh, traversed the Suez Canal. Uh, yes. Um, is it a plus or a minus for Israel? I think it's a plus, but uh, we should bear in mind that uh, mm -hmm. as we had the bad experience in 56 and in 67, that it's up to the Egyptian to agree to do it. Even though that there is a Kushta, uh, let's say... A convention. A convention. Mentioning that uh, everybody can pass through there, it's up to them to decide. So first I have to mention that uh, the, the, the trade with the East is increasing very fast. 25% of Israeli import-export is done through the Red Sea to the East, to the Far East uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. So it, we need the Suez Canal because uh, the main port are located in the Mediterranean. Uh, but uh, speaking about the Suez Canal, uh, we should bear in mind that uh, because of the trade, the global trade, there is another, uh, let's say, uh, slogan coming to the lexicon, lexicon, and it's weaponizing of the choke points. And currently, we see that uh, there is a weaponizing of a choke point of, uh, choke point of uh, Bab el Mandem as well as Hormuz. So solving the Suez Canal problem is not the sole uh, issue for Israel. We should also bear in mind that we have a problem in Bab el Mandeb Strait, and it was demonstrated, I think, during the Yom Kippur War, because we had a blockade from the Egyptian Navy, and the cost price that we uh, pay for it was very hard. But, uh, of course, you are for submarines, you're also for um, missile boats, but and you were uh, second in command of the Israeli Navy. You uh, you built forces, not only operated them. If you had an extra billion shekels or dollars, would you put all of them on submarines? Some of them on on other stuff. How would you divide your resources? I think that uh, it's a mix, and. For instance, I don't know if you know, but uh, I think that uh, the, 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 the COVID that the Israeli Navy uh, uh, bought from Germany for the constabulary mission of uh, protecting the Gaza infrastructure, it's not uh, the, the amount of money we pay for it is not reasonable. Because what you are speaking about, you are speaking about uh, infrastructure that's in the um, uh, vicinity of the coast. You can have other solution, for instance. You are against it? You think it's too expensive? I think it's too expensive. So when you are speaking about the amount of money, I'm a pro surface boat as commandos, as submarines, as amphibious operation. But you have to see what is the mix and when you put the extra money. And I think that the extra money that we put on the South Six class boat is not justifiable. You can do such a things with uh, 
uh, let's say, uh, smaller boats. For instance, I was the commanding officer of a SAR four-class boat, and in 1976, we sailed the United States. So to, to For the se- bicentennial. Yes, to secure some installation and infrastructure, you don't need to, to buy such an expensive boat. Did uh, the um, aura or air of corruption, which had to do with the so-called submarine scandal, hurt the Navy? I think yes, even though if you are going into the Navy to the lower ranks, they are indifferent to it. But I think that, uh, first of all, I am very happy that uh, with all the suspected, there are suspected people, there is nobody who is uh, wearing the submarine signal here. Uh, Second, I think that within the Israeli Navy, uh, there is a missing of a say that uh, we don't know what happened and it's to the court, but we are condemning all the things like this, as it was with uh, the Israeli Air Force, with Rami Dutan. The and chief of logistics. You are right. And that's, I think it's missing with the higher rank in the Israeli Navy. I think that uh, if I would be an officer in the Israeli Navy, I would like to hear what is the chief of the Israeli Navy, who is currently not involved in or such a thing, say that in the future we would work and we will have some kind of conclusions and lessons learned from this. Uh, some of the suspects were your comrades uh, in arms. Some of them were your subordinates. Um, did you ever suspect that they could uh, be what they turned out to be? I prefer not to answer this question because, as you mentioned, they were my subordinate and they have their, let's say, advantages and disadvantages as I have. So I think that's up to the core to decide, and I wish they will all finish not guilty. But uh, as for the Israeli Navy, with all the rumors, and part of the things are, let's say, uh, proved, I think that uh, I missed some kind of a say that we study, lesson was learned, and in the future will not be involved in such a case. In uh, late uh, 1999, um, the chief of staff, uh, another Shaul, Shaul Mufaz, uh, decided that another officer is going um, to be uh, appointed uh, Navy chief. And you changed careers um, in a way. Was it natural from you, for you to move from the Navy and in particular submarines to the atomic energy field? Uh, first of all, um Prior to the decision, I was in the general staff. I was nominated as, uh, in the general staff to be head of the division, uh, division and uh, ABC. Uh, so I Special start, munitions. Yes, so I start to understand what does it mean. Uh, when I was retired, I decided not to go back to the, to the uh, defense, uh, uh, let's say, establishment. Uh, and uh, I went to the, the high tech and started, uh, let's say, qualification to be a manager in this case. And uh, as it worked for me in the summary for Lila, it worked for me this time. And uh, I was offered with such a position. And I In was, two minutes? Not in two minutes, but uh, yes. So, so you um, became first the number two guy at the Atomic Energy Commission then went back to the defense ministry for similar uh, work, and then was promoted to to head uh, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission for eight years? Eight years, yes. What can you tell us about it? Not many things. There is, uh, there is no transparency in the Atomic Energy Commission? They should go to some kind of transparency with what they can uh, do. And I think that they, in the last year, and I remember what I did, I think that uh, you need to have some kind of transparency, especially with uh, people who might be affected. And uh, I mean safety-wise? Safety-wise, with uh, municipality, municipality people near to the Dimona. Uh, in Sorek, we have no problem to deal with it. So uh, when I joined this job, I think that part of it is policy-oriented job, 
and one of it is uh, uh, with the atomic energy. And it, it was fascinating, especially uh, with the condition which if is unique to Israel to be in all the international fora and to try to justify it. If Israelis uh, could know uh, what was happening there, would they have been prouder? Uh, would they have uh, risen uh, to sleep better? I think that they should be proud. I think that they should be secure. And uh, what I think more is that uh, we should be very uh, modest and prudent. Otherwise, we will behave like the people that we are condemning all the time that are trying to uh, mention what they will do with such uh, things. Admiral Horev, Professor Horev, uh, from what you know, you, uh, from your naval and military experience and from your atomic energy experience, is Iran a real threat to Israel? Is it existential? Not yet, but Iran is... Uh, ex- First of all, I think that the, the, the security uh, situation in the Middle East and for Israel is uh, very good. I think that there is no country that uh, threatens Israel, Israel today. It's not like the 56, 67, so we should realize that uh, in the Middle East we are considered to be, uh, let's say, a major power. And this aspect, I think that uh, we should uh, be prudent Iran is a threat for, for Israel, not only because of the nuclear weapon. I think that the Iran is an ideological uh, enemy of Israel, and it's leading the, 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 the bloc, the Shia bloc, and they would like to, to, to have their uh, ideology spread in Lebanon as well as but, in the Red Sea. But as we are speaking uh, in the summer of 2021, it is not yet an existential nuclear threat. You're right. Professor, retired Admiral Shal Horev, thank you for a very, very enlightening conversation and thank you from Jerusalem. Thank you very much.